1460, the new WXBR. You are listening to the Metro South Morning Show. PM in the AM, Peter Zimbor and Mike Peva here with you on this Tuesday morning. Remember, you can follow us on Twitter at PM in the AM Boston. Like us on Facebook, PM in the AM, the Metro South Morning Show. And the best place to hear archived interviews and segments from this particular program is on our official YouTube channel at youtube.com slash PM in the AM Boston. Mike, one thing that we have not done in the last few months that has been a mainstay here on the AM 1460 frequency since this uh, entity came into existence in the early 2000s is discuss Brockton Rocks baseball. Mm-hmm. But that's going to change right now. Sure is. Joining me in studio is the current vice president for Brockton Rocks baseball, Mr. Andy Krasley. Andy, uh, good morning and welcome back to the AM 1460 frequency. It's hey. been a long time. Good morning, guys. It's great to see you again. Describe for the folks that are unaware of your history with the Brockton Rocks, because you worked for the previous incarnation of the Brockton Rocks, I guess we'll call it, that was a professional team, a part of the Can-Am League, before leaving, trying some other things, and then coming back here to what is now the Wooden Bat League, Brockton Rocks. Yeah, I've done just about everything you can do with the Rocks. I, uh, when the team opened up for business in 2002, uh, I came to one of the first games here, actually on a date, my third date with my now wife. Um, the next year, uh, 2003, I came here to work for the team, and I sold tickets and uh, did a variety of other front office roles, and I was the general manager of the Rocks from 2005 to 2007. Uh, I was married on the pitcher's mound at Campanelli Stadium on uh, Labor Day 2007, and I've been a season ticket holder in the year since I left the Rocks in 2007. And uh, this fall, there was an opportunity um, to to buy the Rocks, and uh a fellow named Chris English from Milton, Massachusetts, who's got a very long tenure uh, owning uh, minor league baseball teams back to the early 90s, and a guy I had worked for um, a long time ago. Um, got interested in the team, and I said I'd help him out, and so uh, I found myself back here in November when we um, when we took over the team, and uh, we're really looking forward to trying to, you know, provide. The club's been through a couple hard years, there's no question about that, and we're looking to kind of bring it back to its former uh, glory and um, and really kind of turn it around and, and make it a community asset again. You're the general manager for the Brockton Rocks from 2005 to 2007. Now, as we've alluded to, things have changed to some degree since that time to now. The Brockton Rocks, 2005 to 2007, I would say were in their heyday as a entertainment destination for folks south of Boston. You knew that on a Friday or Saturday night there was going to be a few thousand people at that ballpark watching Brock and Rocks baseball, no matter what bobblehead you guys were giving out that night, because <laughs> you guys did have quite a bit of bobbleheads. Now, not a professional team anymore, Wooden Bat League. A good night for the Brock and Rocks now, I would say, is if you draw a thousand, that's a great night. Whereas back then, you draw a thousand on a Friday night, you would consider that a week night. Well, we certainly never drew a thousand back then. Um, you know, from 2004 to 2007, uh, we sold out just about every Friday night we ever played, which is in Cape. Now I said four to five thousand people. Yeah, that's five thousand a night. Um, you know, and, and and the condition of the team's better, a little bit better than you represented it now. You know, there are, there are about fifteen hundred people a night, um, which in wooden bat league numbers is good. But to be honest, you know, we'd be really disappointed if we couldn't improve that significantly. I mean, we think this will be one of the strongest. It's we're going to stay in the. In, in the Collegiate League, which is called the Futures um, Collegiate Baseball League. Uh, and we think we're going to be one of the most uh, popular, top-draw um, college baseball teams in the country uh, in the next year or two. So, uh, you know, our goal is really, you know, we're going to build out from the weekends. So really start with those Friday uh, nights, which will still have the fireworks, the Saturday nights when we typically have giveaways, and the Sunday family fun days. And really try and build out and make those kind of our centerpiece nights where we think, you know, we ought to be able to have, you know, two, three, you know, 3,500 this first year on some of those nights. And, um, and uh, you know, the, the weeknights will continue to be a challenge as they are throughout, you know, minor league and college baseball. Um, but baseball is only part of it, too. I mean, you talked about really being an entertainment destination um, for all of the, the South Shore and Metro South community. I mean, we had amazing concerts here back in the day. We had Def Leppard and Bob Dylan and Willie Nelson and Jack Johnson. Um, and there have been a couple, you know, big shows the last few years, and there have been a couple of, uh, you know, flop shows the last couple of years. But, um, you know, hopefully concerts will be part of the part of the menu. And uh, Brockton High still plays all their games at the stadium. We've got some tournaments that are coming in 
uh, to the ballpark. So we want to, you know, we want to keep the stadium um, busy as much as possible and offer a lot of different kinds of entertainment for people to come enjoy. Had Vince Neal come on this program that week, it would have been much bigger numbers at Campanelli <laughs> Stadium than that, I assure you. Well, uh, technically, Vince Neal was sold out, as I understand it, once they put it inside the Shaw Center. But, um, <laughs> boy, I, 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 you know, I didn't get to see that show. I would have... I'm sure it was a fine show. I'm, I'm sure a, Vince Neal's I'm, I'm a crew fan, but I, I'm not sure I want to see uh, see Vince Neal in his current uh, current state of affairs. So uh, I, I think that's probably just as well that I leave my memories with them of the MTV heyday. You know. Once again, we're chatting with Andy Crosley of the Brockton Rocks here on AM 1460, the new WXBR. You mentioned the new owner of Brockton Rocks Baseball earlier, Chris English is the name, if I'm not mistaken. What value does he see in this organization and team in purchasing it? Well, what does he hope to do with it? Uh, the ballpark is beautiful. Um, you know, Campanelli Stadium is 10 years old now, 11 years old. Um, it needs a little TLC. Um, so we're putting about $300,000 into the ballpark um, this off season. private money. It's all, you know, all Chris's investment. Um, if, you, if you're listening in Brockton and you want to stop by the ballpark uh, this week, you'll actually see what's going on. We've already completely torn out the infield, and we've had uh, sports turf specialties of Rentham who do Fenway Park. Uh, come in and completely um, regrade and rebuild the infield. We've put in a beautiful new um, backstop. It's an antique brick backstop like you'd see at Camden Yards, which is sort of a nod to Brockton's industrial heritage. Uh, we've repainted everything inside the stadium. So, you know, we viewed the stadium as a jewel to begin with, and now we've made some significant upgrades to it. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, Brockton and the surrounding area as a baseball community we know has tremendous potential because there was huge excitement around this team, um, you know, four, five, six years ago, and you would see those crowds of four and 5,000. So, you know, we really feel like, you know, between the facility and the community, it's just a potential to have just a real jewel for the um, southeastern part of the state and, and really something that Brockton can be proud of. I remember when the Brockton Rocks first came into town, and I was still a teenager at the time. I remember thinking to myself that it would be a novelty that would wear off after a few years. And I, then I remember a few years into it saying, well, everything seems to be running so smoothly, this is going to last. And I remember there being a statistic that I read somewhere, I think I read it in a few different places, that the average lifespan of an independent league baseball team was about seven years no matter where they were in the country. And about seven years in, the Brock and Rocks are going strong. And I said to myself, this is going to last for a while. What went wrong in your opinion? Why were those hard times? There. Well, first of all, I should kind of give the disclaimer of saying I wasn't around when the kind of tough times really hit. So my view on that is as much kind of a fan's view as it is a insider's view. But what I would tell you is um, I think the number one thing is that the Brockton Rocks, like a lot of businesses and homeowners and nonprofit organizations in Brockton and, and beyond, got hit really hard, got walloped by the downturn, the financial downturn in 2008, 2009. Not to mention bad weather that particular season, I believe. Yeah, you know, I, I don't recall, you know, what the weather was. The weather's kind of an excuse, though. If you've done your job in the off season selling sponsorships and season tickets, you should be somewhat weatherproof. If you're dependent on the walk-up, that's not a good thing. But, but I'll tell you, you know, they, they, did, they did get walloped by the recession, as a lot of us did as individuals or businesses. And, and maybe the fault there was not, um, responding to those new economic realities as uh, quickly or flexibly as they needed to. Because I think what happened was, you know, as you alluded to, the Rocks had a really strong run for many years. And one of the things that the Rocks did that was different um, than a lot of our competitors in those leagues is that we carried a big front office staff all year round. We'd be carrying 10, 11, 12, you know, really bright people. They weren't making much money, um, but Nevertheless, keeping 11 or 12 people year-round for a seasonal business is a big commitment to doing things in a first-class fashion. And a lot of the teams we were playing, you know, they'd essentially go dark in the winter. They'd run things with three or four people. But we really made a commitment to having a big, robust staff of really bright, hardworking people. Well, you know, in 2008, 2009, when the sponsorship money, you know, dried up with the economy and, and people, you know, had trouble affording season tickets... I think that the Rocks really kind of doubled down and spent a lot of money on advertising and kept their staff the same size. And when that didn't pay off, you know, it really, really, you know, built up some big debts and that starts you into a spiral. 
that's really, really difficult to pull out of. And again, this is this is me kind of doing a little bit of Monday morning, you know, quarterbacking from the outside. But um, you know, once you're in that spiral, it's tough. And at a certain point, I think they kind of went, you know, 180 degrees in the other direction and had and they were shutting down in the off season and they were running really, really lean and trying to get out of the kind of hole that they'd fallen into in those couple of years. And um, and then that's when that's when in the community you start to see that things aren't quite like they used to be. Um, you know, in terms of customer service and game day presentation. And uh, it's a that's a really, you know, the rocks are not far from unique in being in that situation. It's just a really tough hole to pull out of when that grabs hold of you and, and you get pulled out into the undertow. And I think that really the only way really sometimes to come back from that is you do need to find a new a new investor, you know, who, who really wants to essentially reboot it. And that's what's happened to the rocks this off season. Um, and I think that's probably what was going to be necessary to, to, you know, give it an injection of new energy. The most obvious difference between the first incarnation of the Brockton Rocks that you were part of and the current incarnation of the Brockton Rocks that you know the vice president of is that previously the Brockton Rocks were a professional baseball team. Now they're a wooden bat league team consisting of collegiate players. So it's an amateur team now as opposed to a professional team then. I guess that helps you guys out from a business perspective because you guys don't need to pay the players. They obviously cannot be paid if they're amateur caliber players. What's the difference from a from your perspective, your job back in 05, 06, 07 to now because of that? Uh, you know, to be honest with you, I think there's a clear difference in the types of baseball that are being played. Um, but that doesn't really affect my job at all. Um, you know, my job is to provide a great night out of entertainment that's based around a baseball game, you know, for people from the surrounding community. So, we, you know, I can do that portion of my job, whether it's college baseball players or whether it's, you know, low-level professional independent players, which, you know, the Rock's former pro leagues were probably the equivalent of single-A quality baseball, only with players who didn't have um, major league contracts at the time. So, uh, you know, you're going to have some, you're going to have some, I think you can make an interesting argument where we're going to see more major leaguers come out of. The Rocks played 11 years of pro ball and had one player, Stevie Delabar, go to the major leagues. That's a pretty big one. Yeah, and he became an all-star. Um, on the other hand, you know, we have two players coming in this year, one from University of Michigan, one from Virginia Tech, who are projected to be drafted in the first six rounds of the major league entry draft uh, this spring. So, um you know, we play 10 years of baseball with that caliber of player in the league, and we may see more, you know, future major leaguers come out of the collegiate incarnation of Rocks baseball than we will out of the independent pro version. So what we're saying is that even though it's amateur baseball, is that it's not necessarily a lesser quality of baseball than what you saw back in the pro days. It might even be a higher quality of baseball. We just don't know. Time will tell. We don't know. I think there's some things that are different. You know, um, I think that the pro players probably you're going to have more mashers. You know, you're going to have more guys who've grown into their body and are, you know, the guy send gems of the world. You probably remember Guy. That guy was a monster. You know, he, I don't know what he weighed. He must have been 250, 260, and he'd mash 15 or 16 home runs in a 90-game season. Uh, you don't see that kind of uh, player in, in collegiate ball as much. Uh, but on the other hand, you don't – so these these kids are still growing into their bodies. You know, they're not maxing out their arm strength yet or their or their power. On the other hand, they haven't had, you know, three Tommy John surgeries and um, a knee replacement like some of our guys. You mentioned all of the renovations to Camp LA Stadium. What other ways are we going to be able to bring fans back into the stadium this season? Um, I think there's a few things. I think, you know, we need a bigger commitment to promotions. We need a bigger com commitment to community engagement. You know, we were in the, um, you know, even on the most basic level, you know, we were in the Brockton Holiday Parade this year mm -hmm. um, for the first time in quite a few years. And what a blast that was. It's Pete's first <laughs> time, too. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we, we are very reliant on word of mouth. So when people come into the ballpark, you know, they need to be met by people who are smiling. They need to see a ballpark who's clean. They need to have cold beer and hot food. And, um, you know, that's the num that that's more important than any kind of advertising that we can do. Uh, you know, we haven't made a huge stride already simply in having a year-round staff. You know, we haven't had a year-round staff there for a couple of years. But we've got three wonderful people who are working in the front office, um, John Nesty, Sam Salkovitz, and um, Megan Hausler, who are all Brockton High School graduates. 
they're all, you know, natives of the city. They all have, you know, deep roots here and lots of family connections and friends. And, you know, those little things like that really do make a big difference. But at the end of the day, you know, I think a lot of people have the right, um, our, our mantra within the front office this year has been show me, don't tell me. You know, there's going to be a lot of people who've, you know, said over the past couple of years, oh, this is going to be a great season. Um, you know, we're doing some real new, exciting things. And, um, you know, people have heard that before. They need to see it happen. That's starting with the renovations. I mean, that one of the reasons we came in and, and really restructured the ballpark was to show people a tangible difference of what you can see this year from what you've seen in years past. Now we have to follow up on that with everything from, you know, the quality of the promotions, the kind of community presence we have, and how awesome the game day experience is so that people want to tell their friends. Well, I think we'll talk a little bit about some of the promotions perhaps you have in store during the next segment. Maybe we'll offer some suggest some suggestions as well. You're listening to the Metro South Morning Show. PM in the AM, Peter Zimmer and Mike Pava here with you on this Tuesday morning. We're going to step aside for a quick look at local news back with Andy Crosley, Vice President of Brock and Rocks Baseball, when we return. And we're back here on AM 1460, the new WXBR. You're listening to the Metro South Morning Show. Peter Zimbor and Mike Pava here with you once again. Joined in studio by the Vice President of Brockton Rocks Baseball, Andy Crosley. Mike, I don't know if you remember this, but back in 07, I was the pre- and post-game show host for Brockton Rocks Baseball. That's actually where yes, you and I met. That's where we met. The moment me and Mike became really good friends, I was waiting. I'm not going to tell the whole right. story. I was waiting for Brockton Rocks baseball to begin on a Friday night. Mm -hmm. And the show that was on prior to Brockton Rocks baseball was finishing up. And maybe someone on the show that day had a health problem and maybe in, it involved their bladder. It shouldn't have been funny. And just maybe to show us, he dropped his pants in front of us. And maybe me and Mike had to pretend like we weren't laughing hysterically at what we were seeing. But as soon as he left, we felt the floor dying for about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. We've been friends ever since. You know, we've been friends ever since. <laughs> That's a magic story that was told in very vague detail. You're listening to the Metro South Morning Show here, PM in the end. Welcome. A. Andy Crosley was not there for that story. Yeah, I'd like to clarify I wasn't the person <laughs> with the ladder problem. And I'm not sure that was made crystal clear. <laughs> well, we will uh, clarify in case anyone thought that it was you. Back in 07, one of my favorite things of, about Brockton Rocks baseball was that we would sit around a table, I think every Friday afternoon, and we'd have Good News Friday and we'd have promotion ideas of just different ideas that you guys could have for different promotions to have at the ballpark. And I'll throw out my favorite promotion that we had and my favorite promotion that we almost had but didn't quite have. My favorite promotion we ever had was Seinfeld Night at the ballpark, where I will take full credit for the best idea of Seinfeld Night, which was then play-by-play -play announcer Chad Goldberg uh, reeling a rye marble bread, rye. a marble rye, up from the crowd in the press box. And my favorite promotion that we almost had but didn't quite have completely was Kiss the Season Goodbye, where in the last game of the season there was going to be a Kiss tribute band, and all these like Kiss-clad biker guys showed up at the ballpark that night. So it's funny that you mentioned the Marble Rye because um, the director of promotions that year was a real good friend of mine named Bailey Fry. And Bailey is now the director of special events for the Baltimore Orioles. Going with the Camden Yards theme now at the ballpark. Yeah, you know, it's funny. We talked about Stevie Delabar before the break being the only Rocks player who ever made it to the major leagues during the 11 years that the Rocks were a pro team. Um, he may have been the only player, but there's actually about five or six Rocks front office employees who went to the major leagues. Um, Bailey is uh, in the Baltimore Orioles front office. Uh, Andrea Thrubis, who was the community relations director here, has a public affairs job with the Tigers. Dave Raymond, who was a WBET uh, or XBR. He was a BET um, guy. Play-by-play -play in 2005, became the play-by-play -play guy for the Houston Astros for five years. Is he no longer with the Astros? He's working for Major League Baseball Advanced Media out of New York City right now. Um, she's got a great job with Major League Baseball. Dave Raymond, the only WBET personality in the history of BET to have appeared in the David Letterman show while being on the air, if I recall correctly. <laughs> and I think the only guy ever did leap from independent baseball to the major leagues in one season as a radio man. But uh, And then Kelly Frank was KO the first year of KO, um, the mascot, in 2003, and she later became Raymond, the mascot of the Tampa Bay Rays. So... 
Uh, Brockton was a great pipeline in the major leagues for people who worked in the front office. But anyway, back to Seinfeld night. Um, I was talking to Bailey about a month ago, and I asked her what's her favorite promotion he ever did, and she said it was Seinfeld night, and she did a, said that same image of, of uh, Chad wheeling the marble rye up. Um, the Kiss the Season Goodbye was an awesome promotion. It was Gene Simmons' birthday. Yes. And, and uh, if you recall, I tried like hell to get Gene Simmons on the pregame show that night, but he declined. And the root of that was that we all went over to, the staff all went over to Westgate Pub one night. We went bowling and then we went to Westgate Pub. And there was a Kiss tribute band playing there to about eight people. And um, I don't remember what they were called. Kistery. Kistery. And they were really good. Uh, they were really good. And the guy who did Ace Fraley was, like, awesome. He was be- And the drummer was better than Peter Chris. And the guy who did Ace Fraley was, was terrific. And um, so we heard them, and the kind of idea percolated. And the team was all play- was all wearing these fireball red uniforms with Gene Simmons patches on the side, and the rocks across the chest was done in the Kiss logo font. And we had a lot of fun with it. We had we found somebody found a team of majorettes that dressed up in this like uh, kind of like S and M uh, black leather outfits with the Kiss makeup and did like baton twirling stuff. And actually, they weren't that great at the baton twirling, but the presentation was awesome. So they came out, and um, you know, and it was I should clarify, it was still family friendly. Yes, but, <laughs> but it, it was it was on the edge a little bit of that. It, it, it was it was great. And but the one thing about that game was uh, at the end of the game, we were going to drive a um, flatbed truck onto the field, and that was going to be the stage for Kistory to play a post-game show. The sound check was exceptional. The sound check, the sound check was deafening. They played Christine 16, and I remember I walked from home plate all the way across the street to the fairgrounds and all the way up Forest Avenue, and I could still hear it. Uh, it was too loud, to be honest, but uh, we had to turn them down. But they were going to play a post-game set for, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes. They were taking requests. Ace did 2,000 man. That would have been awesome. Um, unfortunately, that was the one game all year. I think the game went like 14 in. No, it didn't go into extra innings, it went- it, but it was the longest nine-inning game. It was a four-hour-plus nine-inning game. Ugh. It was like... You know, situational pitching change after situational pitching change. And not only was it a four-hour-plus game, but I believe that the game, being the last home game of the season, had no impact on either team making it to the postseason. So it was just long for the sake of being long. Yeah, it, it, it was. I was sitting up in the booth. I was playing the music that night. I was playing all the Kiss tunes in the booth. And I was sitting up there almost on the verge of tears in like the eighth or ninth inning when, I, as I could see our curfew coming closer and closer and closer and knowing that we weren't going to be able to put this show on. So I think the band ended up coming out and doing like an autograph signing. And then they came back a month later and they played a show at the Shaw's, but it wasn't the same. But I, I, for all of that, though, that, that the Kiss the Season Goodbye night, the Gene Simmons night, was named one of the top ten minor league baseball promotions of the year by ESPN that year. I remember being back at the studio and having the Chad Goldberg in queue so we could talk to each other during commercial break. And him saying to me, I don't know if this announcement is going to go over too well with the crowd. And as soon as the postponement got announced, boo. But everything made good when they came back and rocked the Shaw Center a month or so later. What are some of your other favorite promotions of Brock and Rock's past? And there were some other, let's let's not call them promotions, but publicity stunts of Brock and Rock's past that were absolutely gargantuan in terms of national media coverage. Well, boy, there's so many favorites to choose from. And I can tell your team, you have to tell a story about you. So I will I'm not that. exactly <laughs> going for that one, but I will take full credit for that one. Um, there, there there's, were, there's other ones outside of that that you could go with. There were a few. There was a, there was a year when we signed a, a player who was not good. I mean, he was like the 11th player, 11th pitcher on a 10-man pitching staff. I think he might have only played one game for us, but his name was Emmanuel Ramirez. So our, pitch, our press release, of course, was Rock signed Manny Ramirez. <laughs> that got a lot of attention. Um, you know, we did a bobble election in um, 2004 when Jim Fander was running the promotions, which was um, John Kerry and George W. Bush bobbleheads, and you went into a porta potty to cast your vote, and when you came out of the porta potty, Either the Democratic or Republican porta potty, you got your um, your bobblehead, and we did that in six cities across the country, and five of those six accurately predicted the way the election went in that particular state. So that was pretty cool. Um, I, I like when they had the battery from the Bad News Bears. Yeah, and you know what's funny about the Bad News Bears night was we almost had Jackie Earl Haley, 
and he wasn't acting at the time, who played uh, Kelly in the original films. He wasn't acting at the time. He was living in San Antonio doing like um, corporate video production or something. And and he, at the last minute, he was really regretful. He's like, oh, you know, I got a gig. I can't make it up. The next year, he got cast in his comeback film, which I no longer recall what that was. But since then, he's gone on to be nominated for Academy Awards, and he's been in Martin Scorsese movies, and that would have been a trip to have him. Um, so the game where the Bad News Bears battery pitched to one batter, I believe, and I think they walked him, and he took first base. Who would have been the starting pitcher for the Rocks that night had it not been Bad News Bear night? And who had to sit and wait for one at-bat to head into the game? Do you remember who that would be? I have no idea. Dennis Oil Can Boyd. <laughs> and I remember Dennis Oil Can Boyd saying to me right before they went out, he goes, I hope that either hits a home run or he strikes him out because I don't want anyone on base when I step on there. <laughs> Uh, the oil can was great, and I wasn't. I, this was after my time at the at the Rocks. But as a fan, I came back the night Bill Lee became the oldest man I. to win a professional game, and that was amazing. Um, I think you know. I think he only gave up one run in five innings. Uh, that was incredible. Uh, but uh, here's the story that I know that you want me to tell. Yeah, let's let's let's, let's talk about me, guys. Uh, and, and this is this is really impressive, Peter, because I think you were. Maybe I was six, 18, 16 19. or 17 years old. Maybe I was 17. I don't know. <laughs> but in, in, in Red Sox fans will remember, uh, I believe this was in no, uh, November of 2005, there was some sort of internal blow-up between Theo Epstein and Larry Lucchino. And for a brief time, Epstein quit the Red Sox. And he, this was when he snuck out of Fenway Park in the gorilla suit in the middle yes. of the night to avoid the media waiting outside. And so Theo Epstein was out of a job in 2005. I'd recently become the general manager of the team. And we put out a press release offering him my job. Um, you know, we knew he was out of work. We said, you know, rocks invite Theo Epstein to take over the GM. You role. gladly said he could take your cubicle in the press release. I was. We were going to give him a free parking spot. We we're going <laughs> to give him a ninety-two thousand dollars annual payroll to play with. I remember that. To his heart's delight. And I was going to demote myself to director of promotion so that we would have um, that title available for him. And it was a funny little press release. We put it out. It got picked up all over the country. Got, ESPN took it. Uh, Yahoo Sports Asia took it. Um, <laughs> it, it just we were counting all the kind of places that came across the ticker. But um, what quickly happened was, you know, some of the local TV stations in Boston thought it was really funny, and it must have been a slow news day. And they all were trying; they, they were all trying to get a quote from Theo about it. And a lot of them were calling us, thinking that we had connections to the Red Sox and we could help them get a quote from Theo, or that, or, or actually believing that we had talked to him, which we hadn't. We'd simply fax out a. a it was a fabricated a phony, publicity stuff. Yeah, a phony press release that took about five seconds mm -hmm. um, to hit send. Um, so anyway, you know, it, we got our two or three days of fun and, and off-season promotion out of that, and it kind of faded away. No one ever got a quote out of Epstein. And then uh, a few months later, I'm in my office one day, and Peter Zimbor walks in. And Did uh, I actually walk in? I think so. I think we're in my okay. office. Maybe I went over to the BCA TV. I'm not sure. But he's, he came in. He came by months later and told me he had something to show me. And it was you, uh, and, and you were a teenager at the time, I'm pretty sure. I was. Uh, crashing Theo Epstein's <laughs> annual uh, like rock and roll um, fundraiser thing that he does at the Paradise. Which Rock is coming World. up in January, folks, for those wanting to attend. Yeah, I can't believe I'm drawing a blank in the name. but he does Hot have, Stove Cool Music. Hot Stove Cool Music, yeah, with Peter Gammons and Kay Hanley and, and all those great Boston rock legends. And I don't know if you wrangled a media pass or what you did, but you were in that building. I did. And... Um, you know, you had this video that was edited together that gradually shows me, shows you interviewing Gammons and then uh, Theo's brother. Bronson Arroyo. Bronson Arroyo, asking them, you know, whether whether you thought, they thought Theo regretted not taking the Rocks job. By this time, I think he was back with the Sox. And, and I thought it was very amusing. I was very impressed with your moxie to have gotten in there and gotten Bronson Arroyo and Peter Gammons. And, but then, but I, 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 I can't say I was truly blown away until the next frame came up, and it was you and Epstein himself, Theo <laughs> Epstein. And you asked him point blank about his regrets about not taking the Rocks job. And to his eternal credit, uh, he played that totally in character and just said, you know, um, I didn't think I was ready for the awesome responsibility I was brought in Rocks Baseball, so I, I, I decided I had to, to season myself for another year with the Boston Red Sox. Great. I remember great. I remember 
As I asked, you scooped, you scooped the entire Boston media establishment that day, Peter Zimbar. As I asked him the question, normally I never give up the microphone to my interview subject because I want to be in complete control. But I knew there was a chance he was going to be so pissed off at the ridiculous nature of my line of question that when he took the microphone, I let him do it. And he played up to it, even with the subsequent follow-up questions. He was a good sport about the whole thing. So yeah. I'm a Theo fan. That, that was fun. There were some promotions that also didn't go the way they were supposed to go. We did a prom night, which was um, was supposed to end with people dancing under the stars, or actually under the fireworks. It was a Friday night, and people could come in their old um, prom dresses and, um, well, mostly prom dresses. I guess guys don't really keep their their tuxes, but you know, we encouraged women to dig out their old prom dresses and guys to rent tuxes. And it was a Friday night, so there was fireworks after the game. And after the game, we had parquet out on the field and you could come dance on the field under the fireworks but we didn't account for how popular the promotion was going to be and as soon as we shut off the stadium lights and plunged the stadium into darkness for the fireworks people started vaulting over the sides of the field um, over the railings and we ended up with sort of a near riot on the field and no <laughs> dancing um, that was a little scary um, in hindsight it was funny but at the time it was uh it was not particularly well executed. Did people actually come dressed up in the dresses? And oh, things? yeah, oh, absolutely. Man. All the way back to the 70s, you know, Chris and crazy stuff. But, um, you know, everyone, you, you, you got to be willing to blow a few of them. You gotta, if you want to have great promotions, you got to be willing to have some that really take a left turn and, and, go, and go bad. Um, otherwise, you're going to end up with a bunch of promotions that are kind of like very conservative and down the middle and nobody pays any. They're not bad, but they're not good, and they just become white noise and nobody pays attention. I have a favorite. It was the food fight on the field one year. And I'm sure people working there did not enjoy that one because they had to clean it up after. Um, we did enjoy that except for Tommy Hass at the groundskeeper. He wasn't a big fan of Poor that. Poor Tommy. I saw Tommy Hass at the groundskeeper one time plug in an extension cord submerged in water. And as he's doing it, I'm thinking to myself, this guy's going to electrocute himself before my eyes and die. Nope, he was fine and just walked <laughs> away about his business. That's I'm because like, Tommy's immortal. He really is. And he's the only Rocks person who's been there since the first year in 2002. Oh. Well, one of the things that we're really happy about with this with this renovation is that we've given Tommy the kind of field that he deserves again because he's one of the best groundskeepers in professional baseball. When, this, when the Rolling Stones came up to play Fenway Park, um, I forget how many, six, seven years ago now, I think um, they had huge tractor trailers out in the field and then there was a Red Sox game a day or two later and Tommy was one of the groundskeepers that they pulled in to try and restore Fenway to proper playability. I mean, people know that he's top of the game, and, and the field hasn't been its best the last couple of years, so we're really happy to give him back a field that's worthy of his talents. Tommy is a man of few words, but when he speaks, you listen. And he, There's this urban legend around Brockton about Tommy that, that uh, the Bill Murray character in Caddyshack, the groundskeeper at the golf course who's trying to blow up the, the woodchucks or the gophers, is based on Tommy Hassett. And... Uh, I don't know how that started because I don't know how Tom, how old Tommy is, but he couldn't be old enough to be the model for that Caddyshack character. I will say that when Bill Murray does visit the ballpark, him and Tommy are pretty tight, though. They spend a lot, they spend a lot of time together. Wow. But I, 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 you know, as far as that legend, I don't know where it started. I can't say it's not true, but it would have had to have been based on like a very young Tommy Hassett. Well, maybe we'll get the chance to ask Bill Murray someday on the airwaves. Uh, Tommy Hass is still involved in the team. Bill Murray, any involvement with the Brockton Rocks to this day? Uh, not that I'm aware of. We'd love to, we'd of course, welcome him back with open arms at any point, but he's not involved in the ownership currently, no. Well, let's talk about the Brockton Rocks moving forward. We've talked a lot about the fun promotions of Brockton Rocks past. Is there anything that you guys have planned for the 2014 season? And I acknowledge we're six to seven months away However, is there anything in the works that you guys can say you're working on right now? Yeah, I mean, I th we're we're kind of not into the wacky stuff yet. You know, that'll percolate over the course of the winter. But I think what we're really looking at now are what are the kind of promotions that are not publicity stunts but are really more um, uh, earnest um, efforts to engage with the community and get people excited again, especially get kids involved with the team. You know, because at the end of the day, you know, kids are the ones who really have, you know, that sort of, um, wonder for for baseball and being on you know they walk out on the field and their eyes just pop wide open to get to walk even on the grass you know after a game on Sunday so you know one of the things we're working on I can't give all the details because we haven't finalized it yet but we are hosting the All Star Game for the league this year it'll be on J uh, July twenty eighth so um, we have we are 
uh, hoping, and I think it looks good, you know, to work with Brockton Public Schools to really get um, a couple of the grades in the Boston Public, uh, Brockton Public School System uh, engaged in uh, creatively in the um, in the in the design and the um, promotion of the All Star Game. And I can't. I wish I could give you more detail than that. I'd love to come back and talk to you about it when we finalize it because it's going to be really, really cool. Um, and then uh, one of the things we're really excited about is uh, Brockton High School and Cardinal Spellman have not played each other in high school baseball in more than a decade. Uh, this year they are playing each other. So um, we've been talking to Bill Maloney over at um, Brockton High about um, about having that Spellman Brockton High game be a night game this year. And um, and doing it up like a real Friday Night Rocks game with fireworks, That'd be great. with video headshots of the the players on both of the high school teams, opening up as a free event to the community, um, but with a recommended donation so that we can do some fundraising for the athletic programs of the, those two schools. We should work together on that because I'm an alum of Cardinal Spellman and Peter. So you want to you, you want to go against yeah. each other? Is what yeah, you're yeah. This could you be guys, great. You guys could be the first base coaches for, the, for both teams. <laughs> Genius doing promotions in high school baseball. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think that could be. I think that could not only be a wonderful promotion and fundraiser this year. I think that could become an annual tradition. Cool. Um, and, and you know, we we view Campanelli very much as not only the home field of Brockton Rocks, but the home field of the Brockton Boxers. And and we'd like to do more to promote um, attendance at their games as well. Um, so my hope is that that game becomes an opportunity for these kids to play in front of, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 2,500 uh, people, including, you know, current students and alumni from both schools and people who just love baseball, you know, in the, in the city. So uh, that's one that we're really excited about. Is there any collegiate games coming to Campanelli Stadium in the summer of 2014 as you guys had Boston College and a number of other college uh, baseball teams play at that field in years past? Yes. Um, we're still finalizing um, – some home field deals with a couple of schools, but there'll probably be at least two college programs in the area that are making Campanelli their home field this year for summer, all of their games. Uh, and there may also be a college, uh, uh, college divisional tournament, uh, coming to Campanelli, but we haven't quite, you know, dotted all the I's and crossed the T's on the, that, those yet, but there'll be a good amount of college baseball there this year. The 14 inning game has just struck my recollection. It was a Boston college game. That was going by very quickly on a Saturday afternoon. You said, oh, man, I'm going to be home by 4 o'clock. And it kept going and going and going. And 9.30 came around and finally ended. <laughs> Once again, we're chatting with Andy Crosley, Vice President of Brock and Rocks Baseball, here on AM 1460, the new WXBR. And let's talk about you personally a little bit. Outside of uh, the offer, not too personal, Andy, but outside of you getting the offer to come back to the Brock and Rocks, uh, what made you want to come back to Brock in a place where you clearly have some fond memories? You got married on the field. Yeah, I mean, I, I I went away only in the sense of stopping working for the team on a full-time basis about six years ago, but I've continued to live in the community. I live in Stoughton, and, um, you know, my, my wife and I, got, as I, as you mentioned, we got married here. A lot of my best friends are people that I met either through people who worked at the Rocks or people in the community, and um, we've, you know, we've still been very engaged here, and we've come back um, and watched the games, and, uh, you know... Um, when I saw that Chris English was getting involved and I knew that he ran first class baseball operations, it just did seem like a perfect opportunity to to just offer whatever I could offer in terms of personal experience or you know suggestions um, about how you know things have been done in the past and how things might be done in the future to try and you know uh, make people proud of the rocks being their hometown team again so um, uh, you know it's just a team that I really love and a community that I really love and um, you know, very happy to be able to be part of it again. Short-term goal, where do you see yourself one year from now reflecting upon the Brockton Rocks 2014 venture? Uh, my hope is that we've hosted a very successful All-Star game, um, that we um, that we were profitable. Um, you know, that's always a hope as a business person, um, but probably not the most important. Uh, and then also that um, we won a championship. Um, it's been 10 years since the Rocks won a championship in 2003, so... Uh, we're due. We're we're past due for a championship, and um, and, and I think also that I think uh, as I said, our mantra this year is "Show me, don't tell me." We're expecting a lot of people to be really skeptical of the various claims that we make. You know, either things I've talked about today or things that we you know talk about in people's offices or or um, 
you know, the other places we meet over the winter to tell people about our plans. My hope is that, you know, a year from now at this time, you know, people will say, uh, you know, okay, we believe you. You know, we believe that you guys really have a long-term commitment um, to this ballpark and to this community, and uh, we like what we saw in year one. That's Andy Crosley of the Brockton Rocks joining us here on AM 1460, the new WXBR. Andy, before we let you go this morning, any final words for our listeners? Uh, I would just say, um, you know, make sure to check out BrocktonRocks.com. Um, you know, you get a lot of news on the new team, including um, we have cut all of our season ticket prices by 25 to 50 percent from the prices last year. And we've also reintroduced our six game uh, mini plans, which were very, very popular in years past, but had kind of gone by the wayside. So we have a Marvin Hagler mini plan and a Rocky Marciano mini plan that are six games each for 36 bucks. So it's a great stocking stuffer type of item for the holidays. So make sure to uh, go to BrockdenRocks.com or call our office at 508-559-7000, and we'd be happy to tell you more about um, the new uh, goings-on at the ballpark and uh, how you can incorporate the Rocks into your holiday giving plans this year. Well, Andy, I want to thank you so much for coming on the program this morning. Thanks. That's Andy Crosley of the Brock and Rocks joining us here on AM 1460, the new WXBR. We'll step aside for a local news update. Back with more of the program after this.